batch had long taken exception to using bacteria, the product of disease, as a cure for disease. He wanted to find a natural, pure equivalent for the seven bacterial nosodes he had previously discovered. So he began to experiment with plants that might replicate their effects. Batch's transformation from traditional physician to holistic healer was well underway. By the standards of his day, when doctors were expected to be rather reserved and distant, Edward Batch was known as an unconventional man. It wasn't uncommon for him to join in sing-songs in the pub and stand drinks for the locals. He would sit in the bar and watch how people behaved. This, in particular, always being an endless source of fascination for him. Despite this sociable side to his nature, formal occasions made him a reluctant guest. At one particular dinner party, in a large banqueting hall, he began examining the faces, gestures and mannerisms of the other guests as a way of curing his boredom. He considered how he might group these personalities and emotional types, and he wondered if those with similar types of personalities and emotions would suffer the same diseases. In a flash, his intuition told him that all these people could suffer from every kind of disease, but the way they reacted to the disease could be grouped together. He realized that the answer to treating disease was not to focus solely on the chronic disease alone, but instead to find a treatment for the negative moods and emotions that were responsible for the breakdown in health in the first place. With the help of these insights, he categorized several emotional states of mind and could see how more would be needed. He was determined to devote the rest of his life to this new system of medicine that he was sure nature could provide. It was the search for these new, simpler and more natural medicines that took Dr. Batch to the Welsh countryside. In Wales, in 1928, he found Impatiens glandulifera and Mimulus guttatus growing wild and prepared remedies from them using homeopathic methods. Dr. Batch began using the new flower-based remedies on his patients. He prescribed them based on the patient's personality and achieved immediate and remarkable success. Next, he added clematis to his collection. These three remedies were so successful that by the following year's end, he had given up using any other medications while continuing to look for more remedy plants to prepare. In 1930, Batch did what other physicians considered the unthinkable. He turned his back on orthodox medicine, abandoning his extremely lucrative London practice to devote himself entirely to the search for new remedies from the pure and simple herbs of the field. He asked Nora Weeks to accompany him as his assistant. Dr. Batch continued to strip out unnecessary ideas and theories from his practice including the old laboratory-based methods of making remedies. Instead, he devised two new ways of preparing the flowers. The earliest of these was the sun method. Dr. Batch placed fresh flower heads in a bowl and stood them in unbroken sunlight so that the plant energy would be infused into the water. A few years later, when he had settled at Mount Vernon, he found a second method, the boiling method which he used for 18 of the remedies. In this method, he would collect the flower parts and boil them in water for half an hour before leaving them to cool. To make the medicines, Dr. Batch mixed the energized water with equal parts of brandy, which was chosen as a preservative. The resulting liquids he called the mother tincture. He then made stock bottle dilutions by adding two drops of the mother tincture to 30 milliliters of brandy. From 1930 to 1934, Dr. Batch and Nora traveled over scattered corners of England and Wales, preparing and testing remedies from many plants. He experimented using these preparations with his patients. Over time, he settled on 19 remedies. Most of the remedies were made from flowers, with the exception of rock water, which was potentized in 1933 using water from a forgotten spring. In a couple of instances, olive and vine, 
he wrote abroad and asked friends in Switzerland and Italy to prepare the remedies to his instructions so he could try them out on his patients. One of his favorite rural destinations was a seaside town on the east coast of England called Cromer. He enjoyed observing the dynamics between the relaxed tourists and the locals going about their daily lives. The observations that Batch made in this tranquil setting reinforced his theories regarding different personality types. While everyone in the town faced similar day-to-day -day challenges, people's reactions to any given situation were very individualized. It was while living in Chroma that Dr. Batch discovered many of the early remedies. Agrimony, chicory, vervain, centaury, serrato, scleranthus, and oak. And it was also in this town where a nautical emergency put Batch's work to the test. On December 14, 1933, a ferocious storm was brewing out at sea. Lifeboats had been dispatched to rescue two fishermen from the sinking barge, the Sepoy. For six hours, the rescue boats tried to launch, but the seas proved too rough. Finally, a lifeboat perched on the bow of the barge and pulled in one fisherman lashed onto the mast who was foaming at the mouth, delirious and not expected to live. In fact, his rescuers felt it was a certain death. As the fisherman was brought to shore, Dr. Batch insisted on trying to save the man's life and moistened the fisherman's lips with a combination of remedies that he referred to as rescue remedy. As the story goes, within moments of Batch's efforts, the man sat up asked for a cigarette and was then taken to the local hospital. By this point in Batch's life, the flower remedies were already gaining fame through word of mouth. He had published several articles and books on the healing powers and efficacy of the remedies, yet the medical profession was slow to accept his ideas of healing. He also advertised his remedies in newspapers, much to the disapproval of the General Medical Council. For the next four years, threats were made to strike his name from the medical register. Finally, he retaliated by penning a letter to the council, stating that he no longer considered himself a physician, but a herbalist. And in a later letter, he rescinded his association with orthodox medicine never to hear from the General Medical Council again. After years of traveling, Dr. Batch and his assistant Nora felt it was time to establish a center where they could continue making their remedies. They settled into a rented Victorian cottage called Mount Vernon in the sleepy village of Sotwell, Oxfordshire. Their dear friend, Victor Bullen, a builder from Cromer, joined them later to help them in their work. Batch was delighted to find that almost all of the remedy plants grew within a mile or two of this new home. With his savings from his London practice days now well spent, there was little money left for furnishings. He collected wood and made his own furniture, which still resides in Mount Vernon today. And though money was sparse, Dr. Batch would not charge for his services or remedies. He felt that health was the right of every individual and his remedies were simply a natural extension of healing. Ironically, it was the patients themselves who felt uncomfortable about the free consultations. Many wouldn't return for a second visit because they felt they were taking advantage of his good nature. So Dr. Batch put a charge on the treatment to make people feel that they weren't just taking but giving something in return. <laughs> 